a spaceship passes Earth at a speed of 0.8 c, so 80% of the speed of light. The crew on board measures the time between two events to be 2.5 times 10 to minus 6 seconds. What is the time between the two events as measured by an observer on Earth? This question examines the concept of time dilation due to the relativistic velocity of the spaceship at 0.8 c. So time dilation is governed by the following equation. It was t0 divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared divided by c squared. t0 refers to the time measured by an observer inside the same inertial frame of reference as the object that is a spaceship traveling at a relativistic velocity. So in this question, t0 refers to this number here, 2.5 times 10 to minus 6 seconds. t refers to the time recorded or measured by an observer that's outside the initial frame of reference, which is traveling at relativistic velocity. So in this case, this refers to the stationary observer that's on Earth, who is also observing the relativistic velocity of the spaceship. So really this question we're trying to find out what is the time measured by, what is the time here in this equation. So this is equal to 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6 in the numerator divided by 1 minus 0.8 c, and this is squared, divided by c squared. To make our calculation simpler, we can keep the velocity in terms of c, because later on the c squared in the numerator in this expression is of a square root will cancel out all the c squared in the denominator. So c squared here, the c squared will cancel out, and this is equal to 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by. Now don't forget that although the c squared and c squared cancel out, the square still applies to the 0 0.8. So here we have 1 minus 0 0.8 squared inside the square root left over in the denominator. Now we can enter this expression into our calculator to find the final answer, which is 4.2 times 10 to minus 6 seconds. So the time recorded by the stationary observer on Earth who is observing the motion of the spaceship is longer than the time recorded by, let's say, an astronaut or crew who is in the same inertial frame of reference as the moving spaceship at 0.8 c. A spacecraft with a rest length of 500 meters passes the planet at a speed of 0.6 c. What is the spacecraft's length as measured by an observer on the planet? So we have a stationary observer on the planet, and we so happen to have a spacecraft that's going past at a speed of 0.6 c. As the spacecraft is moving past this stationary observer, the length of the spacecraft, as measured by this stationary person, would be contracted according to the formula L is equal to L0, which is a rest length, multiplied by 1 minus v squared divided by c squared. So L is the length measured by the person who's stationary relative to the moving spacecraft. And L0, or L0, is the rest length, which is the length of a spacecraft that can be measured if the spacecraft is not moving. Or the other way to interpret this is that this is the length measured by an observer that is in the same inertial frame of reference as a spacecraft, because in that case, it will be moving at the same velocity. So in other words, the 500 meters can also be the length measured by an astronaut or crew member that's on board the moving spacecraft. So we can find L, the contractor length, measured by a stationary observer on Earth, by multiplying 500, the rest length, by 1 minus 0.6c squared divided by c squared. Again, we can cancel c squared in the numerator and denominator, which simplifies the expression to be 500 multiplied by 1 minus 0.6 squared. So again, the square still applies to 0.6, even though you have cancelled c squared in the top and bottom. So here we get a contracted length of 400 meters. So from the point of view of the stationary person on Earth, the length of the spacecraft will appear to be shorter than its rest length. An electron moves at a speed of 0.95c relative to the laboratory. Calculate its relativistic momentum of the electron. So the momentum of an object when it approaches a relativistic velocity, that is at a significant fraction of the speed of light, is no longer given by the simple equation of mv. So this is a classical momentum formula.
Instead, it will be given by mv, which is its original momentum, divided by 1 minus v squared by c squared, or square root. So I have the same term in the denominator as we saw in the previous two questions on time dilation and length contraction. To do this question, we are already given the velocity of the electron, which is v, in the numerator and denominator. The mass of the electron is also important, and this is provided in the physics data sheet. So the mass of the electron is approximately 9.109 times 10 to minus 31, so it's quite small kilograms. So the momentum at this relativistic velocity is equal to the mass of the electron times by its speed. Now in this case, we actually need to multiply 0 0.95 by the speed of light, so converting it into proper meters per second, because if I kept it in terms of c, I wouldn't have been able to cancel c with any other term in the expression. Now in the denominator, I can actually keep my velocity in terms of c, so 0 0.95 c squared divided by c squared, because in the denominator, if I keep it in c, the c squared and c squared will cancel, like in time dilation length contraction. But the velocity term in the numerator, I need to actually multiply it by the speed of light to convert it properly into meters per second. So this term here in the denominator will become 0 0.95 squared. This gives me a momentum value of 8.314 times 10 to the power minus 22 kilograms meters per second. If you had calculated the momentum value, using the classical momentum formula, you would have obtained a value that's smaller than the relativistic momentum. A particle and its antiparticle annihilate and produce 5 times 10 to minus 13 joules of energy. What is the mass of the particle? This is a phenomenon and an example of Einstein's energy and mass equivalence principle and equation, which is part or an extension of his theory of special relativity. So when a particle antiparticle annihilates, let's say we'll call this P and antiparticle AP, during the phenomenon of annihilation, what happens is that their combined mass is completely transformed into the energy as provided here. And the characteristic of a particle and antiparticle is that they typically have the same mass and opposite charges. So what we can do here is we can find the total mass of the particle and antiparticle by dividing the energy that was produced or transformed into by c squared. Because the energy is given in joules here, which is an SI unit, I also need to divide it by the speed of light, which is c, in terms of its SI unit in meters per second. So that's 3 times 10 to the power of 8 squared. This gives me a combined mass of 5.6 times 10 to the power of minus 30 kilograms. Now remember, this is a combined mass. To find the mass of the particle, we need to assume the mass of the particle and that of the antiparticle are equal. So then the mass of the particle or the antiparticle is really just this combined mass divided by two, which yields a value of 2.8 times 10 to minus 30 kilograms. An astronaut travels to a star system 12 light years away from Earth at a speed of 0.6 c. So we've got multiple parts of the question. We'll go through this in order. Part A, how long does the journey take according to the observer on Earth? So this question is quite straightforward because we are already given the distance in light years that's measured by an observer on Earth. If this was measured by the astronauts on the spacecraft, it will have to be specified. So this 12 light years is really the rest distance that's measured by a station observer who is not moving relative to the distance being measured, that is, the distance between Earth and this particular star system. So for part A, to find the time taken, this is simply a question of time is equal to the total distance divided by the speed. And we can do this because we're assuming that the spacecraft is moving at a constant speed of 0.6 c. Now, the distance is given in light years, which is a time taken for light to travel this distance. So it takes light 12 years to travel this distance. So you can write this more as 12, the speed of light multiplied by years. And because of this, we can divide by the velocity 
in terms of speed of light, what you see. The light in line is, what you see, will cancel out with the C in the velocity. So we have 12 divided by 0 0.6, which we get 20 years as the final answer. Now, alternatively, you can choose to convert 12 light years into meters, in which case you will need to use the speed of light multiplied by 365 days in a year, 24 hours in a day, etc., and then divided by the speed in meters per second. Now, I find that method much more complicated compared to using the cancellation method if your distance is providing light years. So keep that in mind. Okay, let's go through part B. How much time passes for the astronaut during the journey? So this is asking for the time measured by an observer, that is the astronaut, in the same inertial frame of reference as the moving spaceship. So this time here that they're asking for is really t0. So in part A, we've calculated the time measured by an observer on Earth, that is the stationary time, which is longer than what would be measured as t0 by someone on board the spaceship. So time dilation formula is t equals t naught divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared square root. So in this question, we are finding t0, so time measured by the astronaut during the journey. So if you rearrange the formula, you'll get t times by 1 minus v squared over c squared. t is already calculated in part a, so 20 years multiplied by 1 minus 0.6c, all brackets squared, divided by c squared. Again, we can cancel the c squared and c squared, so we'll get 20 multiplied by 1 minus 0.6 squared. So we have a shorter time of 16 years that is measured by the astronaut on board the spaceship. What is the distance of the journey measured by the astronaut? Now we can calculate this answer in two ways. The speed of the spaceship does not change regardless of the observer. Whether it's the astronaut or the observer on Earth, the speed of the spaceship remains to be 0.6c. So to find the distance that's measured by the astronaut, all we need to do is we can take the speed of the spaceship, that's called a v, multiply by the time that's experienced by the astronaut. So here we have 0.6c times by 16 years, which is the time that we calculate in part b measured by the person on board. And this gives me a distance of 9.6 light years. The unit for distance is light years because I've multiplied the speed in terms of c, which is light, by years. Again, you can choose to convert this unit into meters if you wish to. So you can see this distance, 9.6 light years, is shorter than the 12 light years that was measured by a station observer. So the distance traveled by the spaceship is contracted from the point of view of the person on board because they are moving relative to the starting and end point of this measured distance. Now, alternatively, this is also an example of length contraction. So that's given by the formula L equals to L naught times by one minus V squared over C squared. L is a contracted length, which is what will be measured by the person on board the spaceship. So with, this is equal to the 12 light years as provided by the question. So this is a rest length measured by someone on Earth, not affected by special relativity, times by 1 minus 0.6 c squared divided by c squared. The c squares will cancel out, and this gives me a length of, again, 9.6 light years. So you can find the answer of distance by either multiplying the velocity of the spaceship by the time that's experienced by the person on board, or you can use a length contraction formula by using the rest length that's measured by a station observer on Earth. Hey everyone, if you found this video helpful, smash that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Want even more? Become a Patreon member for early access to videos, exclusive Discord discussions about questions on chemistry and physics, and live preparation sessions for your exams. Don't forget to head over to our website for topic tests and practice exams to further improve your understanding and learning. Thank you.